Today, most of us live in a world where we are free to pursue whatever spiritual path we see fit and worship whatever god or gods we fancy, without fear of reprisal or persecution. That was not the case for medieval Europe, however, when starting in the 12th century, the Catholic Church launched a bloody inquisition that would last for hundreds of years and see tens of thousands of people tortured and executed, all in the name of their version of God. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Echoes of History, and today we're taking a look at some of the greatest horrors of the inquisition. Christianity, originally conceived in ancient Israel, was at its inception persecuted as heresy by the Jewish leaders of the time. Jesus was famously humiliated, beaten, and ultimately crucified for his claims that he was the living son of God. After his death, his closest followers went into hiding until, fueled by their belief that Jesus had risen from the dead as promised, and thus proven he was the son of God, they began to spread their beliefs in Jesus as saviour. This led to their becoming known as Christians, and of the original disciples, many would suffer terrible fates at the hands of the Jewish leadership. Over a thousand years later though, Christianity had arisen to become the prominent religion across Europe. In a bit of irony, it now became the faith that persecuted Jews for their beliefs. Yet, Christianity was being challenged from both within and without, with many Christians deeply unhappy with the Vatican's abuses of power and calling into question problematic Catholic dogma. Others who simply wanted to worship God in their own ways were also threatening the power and influence of the church, and that could not be tolerated. Publicly proclaiming that there could be only one road to God and all else was dangerous heresy that threatened to steer people away from God's love, the Inquisition was launched in the late 12th century. Sadly, the truth was that the church was more concerned with securing its power and wealth rather than the souls of the faithful it claimed were being threatened. The inquisitors were specially trained priests who were instructed in the art of discovering heresy and rooting it out, then extracting penance and confessions from heretics, almost always through torture. When an inquisitor arrived in town, he would immediately announce his presence to the local population and would give citizens present a chance to admit their heresy. If they did, then they would be doled out a punishment befitting their level of heresy. Everything from a forced pilgrimage to holy sites in Rome to severe whippings which could scar a person for life. For inquisitors, true penance could only be achieved through deep pain. Thus, most inquisitors would make use of special bullwhips, which would come with small metal beads at the end in order to deeply lacerate flesh. Others still used a tool known as a cat of nine tails, which was a whip with nine extensions, typically with each one inlaid with small pieces of sharpened metal. The wounds would be so severe that often those receiving this punishment would die from infection or be crippled afterward. Those that survived bore the scars for life, their backs forever disfigured by the horrible whipping. This was, of course, lighter punishment reserved for those who freely confessed. If one did not confess, the Inquisitor would immediately begin their investigation, calling in local townsfolk for one-on-one -on -one meetings. Citizens were encouraged to speak up about the heretical practices of their neighbours, and once accused, there was often little evidence needed to determine guilt. This led to many cases of revenge, in the form of false accusations by angry neighbours, or perhaps just by individuals who coveted the lands or even wives of others for themselves. With the scantiest proof of heresy, one could convince an Inquisitor that their neighbour was a horrible heretic, deserving of the fires of hell itself. Of course, the church itself hardly ever needed much incentive to persecute people as heretics. Count Raymond VII of Toulouse would regularly burn people at the stake for heresy, even if they had confessed when given an opportunity, because often those who were persecuted were Jews, Muslims, or other religious minorities. The process of killing them was little more than a handy way to cleanse the population of undesirables. That included gays, who were persecuted under laws of sodomy and brutally tortured before being killed. In the Kingdom of Aragon in Spain, the Inquisition only stopped giving out the death death penalty for sodomy after almost 1,000 trials, most of which ended with torture and death for the accused. Diego Rodriguez Lucero, an inquisitor nicknamed the Bringer of Darkness, operated from 1499 to 1506 and routinely used the power of his position for his self-gain. Once he sent an innocent man named Julian Trigueros to burn at the stake so that he could take the man's wife for himself after his death. Later, when he desired one of his many mistresses for himself, he sent her husband and parents to burn at the stake. Nobody was safe from Lucero and in one year, 1506, he handed out 100 death sentences. Eventually, the Marquis of Cordoba sent his army to attack Lutero's prison and set all inside of it free. Unfortunately, Lutero escaped, but he was so hated and thoroughly corrupt that the Grand Inquisitor in Rome had him arrested two years later. Because trying Lutero for corruption would be the Catholic Church as the pot calling the kettle black, Lutero was quickly released. In a frustrating lack of karmic justice, he would die peacefully in Seville that same year. For the Inquisitor, extracting confessions was paramount, and it mattered little whether they were real or false. Inevitably, the accused would face one of
one of many different forms of punishment, which weren't meant to actually punish the individual, but rather just get them to confess. One of the preferred methods of exacting confessions was called strapado. In this form of torture, an individual would have their hands tied behind their back and the rope attached to a pulley. Then they were raised so that they would hang from their arms, which would inevitably lead to the shoulders being pulled out of their sockets. Often the inquisitor would raise the victim up high and suddenly drop them before catching their fall, forcing the body to jerk violently, as if this wasn't enough. Weights would often be tied to the person's feet to make the hanging even more painful. The rack was yet another popular tool of the Inquisition, and a very effective one at that. Here the subject had their hands and feet tied or chained up to rollers, at one or perhaps both ends of a wooden frame. The Inquisitor then slowly turned the rollers with a handle, which pulled on the ropes or chains, and stretched the victim's arms and legs until they dislocated. Sometimes the process would simply continue until limbs were torn off completely. Even though mutilation was forbidden by the Church, in 1256, Pope Alexander IV gave Inquisitors the power to forgive each other for any wrongdoing they committed during their torture sessions. This meant that Inquisitors were free to add any form of torture they could dream up to victims who were enduring the torture of Strapado or the Rack, and thus they often did, because why waste a good chance to mutilate someone? If confessions weren't forthcoming, or perhaps the Inquisitor didn't quite believe they were honest enough, they could get inventive with their bound-up prisoner. This would include the use of devices such as the boot, which was a wooden-framed shoe that was placed on the foot of a victim and was slowly tightened until eventually it crushed the bones of the feet and lower legs. Another popular device was the thumbscrew, which was made up of small inserts for each of the fingers on a hand, which were gradually tightened until they crushed the finger bones completely. For women, one of the most horrific implements of torture was known as the breast ripper, which was nothing more than a prong-like iron device that would be heated in a fire and then affixed over each breast, with the Inquisitor violently ripping away the breast tissue until there was little more left than a mass of cauterized tissue. All of these were things the victim would suffer along with their normal torture, designed not just to exact confessions, but to ensure that the guilty would be forever marked by the ordeal. The Judas Chair was number three of the top three torture devices used by the Inquisition and consisted of a pyramid-like seat with a sharpened point at the top upon which the accused was sat on. The point of the pyramid was forced into the anus or the vagina and the Inquisitor would gradually force the victim down onto the device by lowering them from above by ropes they were attached to. Sometimes the ropes were attached from below, allowing an Inquisitor to turn a crank and slowly force the accused down onto the device. Ironically, this was seen as the most humane of the three main methods of torture, as this would rarely lead to death, and instead would disfigure the person and create lifelong difficulties walking. For women, it would basically make childbearing all but impossible. A milder form of punishment was known as the heretic's fork, an ingenious device consisting of a two-pronged fork-like device. The device would be tied around the person's neck, and one end of the forks would be placed. Below the neck, digging into the lower jaw, the other end of the fork would be gouged into the flesh of the chest, securely holding it in place. Thus, the victim would be unable to move their head forward at all without impaling themselves, and the act of speaking was excruciatingly painful. Victims would often be left like this for days before trials in order to encourage their cooperation, even if those trials more often than not ended in being burned at the stake. For anyone who wished to avoid their ultimate fate by trying to impale themselves on the fork, the prongs were placed in such a way that doing so was impossible and would only lead to even more pain instead. The Nuremberg Virgin, or Iron Maiden as it's often known, was a sarcophagus-like device in the shape of a woman with a Virgin Mary placed atop it by the Inquisitors to symbolize the triumph of Christianity over heresy and dissidents. Models differed, but in essence, they all worked the same way. The victim was shoved inside it, and then had the door thrown shut. In some models, the inside of the maiden was rigged with spikes several inches long. In others, there were no spikes, but instead small holes through which long nails could be thrust through. To keep a victim from dying too fast, though, the spikes or nails were situated in such a way that they did not pierce any vital organs, ensuring the victim could stay alive for a long period of time. Models differ, but generally the victim was stabbed through in both shoulders, the lower back, in three places across the chest, on each buttock, and once in the stomach. Some models had special slots for inserting nails that would impale the victim through the eyes, but not so deeply as to penetrate into the brain. Inquisitors might throw someone inside and leave them, until they died of their wounds, the victim trapped in the enclosed space, and unable to move without deepening the wounds they were already suffering. Other Inquisitors would slam the door to the maiden open and shut several times, stabbing the victim through over and over again. Curiously, the device was meant to symbolise the victim entering into the embrace of the Virgin Mary herself, an act that symbolises the Catholic Church's absolution of the accused's sins. The Spanish Inquisition was a time of legalised horror inflicted upon the religious minorities of Europe, mostly Jews, pagans and Muslims. Often the motivations were nothing more than a desire for more wealth and power, with the Church seizing the assets of the accused, even if they were allowed to live after their accusation. 
Men in power who coveted the wives or lands of others would send innocent men to be executed, and jealous lovers betrayed their partners to inquisitors for revenge. While the Inquisition was meant to combat sin, it ironically only ended up enabling some of the greatest sins in European history. Today the world casts a mistrustful eye towards organised religion in most parts of the world, partly due to the heritage of the Inquisition and its many abuses. Yet while we like to think we are far removed from such barbarism, one can't help but wonder given the particular, almost religious-like zeal of some extreme far-right political movements around the world, just how far we really are from a new age of torture in the name of God. One also can't help but wonder how those faithful to a Christ who endured horrible torture would imagine that he would be okay with them inflicting the same on others in his name. Found this video interesting? Check out our other videos.